Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am so just, I'm just delighted to have you guys here on this Tuesday evening. It's, guys, these books are amazing. It's going to be so much fun to talk to these wonderful authors. You guys know me. I'm a big romance fan, women's fiction fan, just these are great books to read um, right now, and I'm so excited uh, to share these with you. Just a couple of updates about Tattered Cover. As you guys know, for anybody who's watched this, my name's McKaylee. I work at Tattered Cover Bookstore. And right now, our stores are actually open to the public. So if you come in, bring your mask um, and wear it for us over your nose and your mouth. Uh, we, you can come in and visit the store for usually about 90 minutes or so. All four of our locations are open um, for purchasing. Every place is open. Uh, Aspen Grove and Colfax are open um, all seven days of the week. Loda is still closed on Mondays, but we're working on getting that open 24 seven for you. Not 24 seven, excuse me. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a bookstore? Uh, open seven days a week for uh, you guys here. But what is open 24 seven is our website. You guys can always still order from us, support your local independent bookstore. We really appreciate it. It's really what's getting us through these times are these events um, that we're hosting here and you guys still continuing to support us uh, in the midst of this health crisis. So we really can't thank you guys enough. We really appreciate it because Tatter Cover prides ourselves on being a community space. And while we cannot physically be in that space together, we're trying to create this virtual community space online. So thank you for continuing to support us and join us with that. Uh, I also just want to let you know that closed captioning is, a, uh, is available for those who might need it. All you have to do is on the screen you're watching me on right now, just hover your mouse over it and there will be a little CC button and you can click on that and that'll have closed captioning uh, for those who might like it. I want to talk about the fabulous three authors that we have here uh, today. So I want to read their bios out, which is just the tip of the iceberg for how wonderful they are. Um, so we have three wonderful authors here today, Jamie Beck, Sonali Dev, and Barbara O'Neill. Jamie is Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author. Jamie Beck's realistic and heartwarming stories have sold more than 3 million copies. She's a two-time Booksellers Best Award finalist and a National Reader's Choice Award winner. And, and critics at Kirkus, Publishers Weekly, and Booklist have respectively called her work smart, uplifting, and entertaining. In addition to writing novels, she enjoys hitting the slopes in Vermont and Utah and dancing around the kitchen while cooking. I love that. <laughs> Above all, she is a grateful wife and mother to a very patient and supportive family. Fans can get exclusive excerpts and inside scoops and be eligible for birthday gift drawings by subscribing to her newsletter on her website. Sonali Dev is a USA Today bestselling author. She writes her stories that let her explore issues faced by women around the world while still indulging her faith in a happily ever after which is what we all need right now. <laughs> Sonali's novels have been on Library Journal, NPR, Washington Post, and Kirkus's Best Books of the Year lists. She has won the American Library Association's Award for Best in Genre, the RT Reviewer's Choice Award, multiple RT Seals of Excellence, and is a, is a Rita finalist and has been listed for the Dublin Literary Award. Shelf Awareness calls her not only one of the best, but one of the bravest romance novelists working today. She lives in Chicagoland, where she and her husband compensate for their empty nest by spoiling the world's most perfect dog. <laughs> and last but certainly not least is Barbara O'Neill, who is actually local to Colorado, which is awesome. Barbara O'Neill is the Washington Post and Amazon Charts bestselling author of more than a dozen novels, including When We Believed in Mermaids, The Art of Inheriting Secrets, and How to Bake a Perfect Life. She lives in the beautiful city of Colorado Springs with her beloved, a British endurance athlete who vows he'll never lose his accent. Damn right, he better not. <laughs> I am so honored to welcome uh, these three women with me here today. So I'm gonna have Sonali, Barbara, and Jamie join me on Zoom. We're gonna have them turn on their videos here and they'll be here in just a moment. Hello everyone. Hi, everybody. Hi. I would love it. Oh, there you are. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'd love it if we could kind of do a quick round robin so that everybody, you guys can introduce yourselves and, you know, kind of give us a quick summary about what is uh, your latest book that's out um, now. I've, in going in order of my screen right now, I have Barbara up next to me. So do you mind starting us off, Barbara? I go first. My my newest book is The Lost Girls of Devon, which is set mostly on the Devon coast. And it's a story of four generations of women mm -hmm. um, kind of playing with 
um, the problems that we all face as we go through life um, and the relationships between mothers and daughters, but also between mothers, I mean, daughters, granddaughters and grandmothers, which is a really different relationship and often really a lot more fun. So that's the latest story. Um, I'll send it over to whoever's next. Uh, Jamie, if you'd like to uh, go next, please. I'm Jamie and my my book that just came out today is Hi, Happy Book Birthday. birthday. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's a big day. Um, so like Barbara, it's a multi-generational sort of coming of age tale where I have a recently divorced uh, woman, her troubled teen daughter and her aging grandmother who has dementia. And basically they, they all have a lot of um, things to learn about themselves and each other in order to um, move forward and live their best lives. And last but certainly not least, Sonali. Hi everyone, and Jamie. Uh, so excited for everyone to read this book. Happy release day. Thank you. Uh, hi, Barbara. <laughs> and um, so my latest uh, is Recipe for Persuasion, and I should have a book, but I don't because I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm traveling right now. But it is, um, it's a two-generational retelling of persuasion, uh, as the title suggests. Uh, set in the San Francisco Bay Area and set on a cooking network show. So it's the story of a chef uh, who is trying to save her father's restaurant and goes on uh, a cooking, uh, a food network show called Cooking with the Stars, which is like Dancing with the Stars, but with <laughs> chefs and celebrities. And of course, because it is a retelling of persuasion, uh, the celebrity she gets stuck with is... Um, is a World Cup winning soccer player, Rico Silva, who, um, whose heart she broke, who basically she dumped under familial pressure back in high school. So it is um, her story, their story of finding their way back to each other, but also um, her mother has a similar story that happened um, when she was really young. And the two women have dealt with it completely differently. So I'm kind of um, trying to explore this whole, um, you know, the patriarchy and the pressure on women to accept life and whatever it throws at you. Um, and almost like the weight of, um, the family's happiness that is strong around your neck and uh, and how we um, how we learn to deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. That was one thing that I, I love that you all mentioned it in your books. It's such a central theme of this idea of multi-generational pressure and how your family is such an influence on your life, especially for women, you know, and, and the idea of being given these burdens and gifts from past generations of women. And I'd love to know from each of you what made you want to write about that? It's it's a very wonderful universal thread, but it's not necessarily the first thing you think of when you write down when you sit down, or maybe it was for you. So I'd love to know how that permeated in, in your each of your brains to create these unique stories. Jamie, you were nodding. Do you mind starting off? <laughs> for me, I think um this story really was largely uh came about because I'm sort of in you know, a similar situation in my own life where um, I'm, you know, I'm in the middle of my life. Uh, I have teen children, one's in college, one's still at home, but he's getting ready to leave. I changed careers in my forties. Um, I'm not getting divorced like Anne, but you know, I've gone through the marital ups and downs and my father is older and very sick. So um, I really wanted to talk about, um, the things that, you know, the women that we, we give up a lot of ourselves to those roles of mother and wife and daughter and whatever. And sometimes you kind of lose a little bit of who you were before all of those things sort of took over. And then if you suddenly find yourself now losing some of those roles as your children push away or your husband or, you know, whatever, you know, there's like this readjustment and reawakening period. So that was part of, that was part of uh, what, drove me to write this particular story. Yeah. And then thank you for that. That's, I wonder, Sonali, did you have a similar impact? Because you took a very classic story, but then you added a, another layer to it with the different generations. So, so how did, how did this idea come about for you and make it something you wanted to write about? So, so for me, it's always a 
whole bunch of seeds that have kind of been germinating in my head. Um, and, um, and, and for this particular um, book, I think one of the things is that it's part of a series that I'm writing where I am trying to pay homage to my four favorite Jane Austen novels. And, um, and really to me, persuasion was about, uh, about mistakes not being final. Yes. right of, of about any mistake being something you can always get over that you can always um, you know life doesn't end with mistakes and a lot of uh, being brought up in um, the culture i was brought up in uh, was a lot of once and done right so so if you slip up and you make mistakes you will not have a chance to fix your life which was a pretty um I think faulty, um, you know, a, a faulty model uh, to, <laughs> to raise children with, but it was, um, so, so when I read Jane Austen's Persuasion, I think one of the, um, you know, one of the main takeaways for me, and I read it very young, uh, one of my main takeaways was the fact that um, you, can, you have a chance if you mess up you know, you'll always have a second chance. So this book was very much about second chances for me. And it was that seed. And then the other, um, you know, the other thing I've always wanted to kind of flip and, and that bothered me growing up was this whole, um, this whole story trope of arranged marriages, right? Where there are these stories where women are placed um, and, and the marriage is just a metaphor, right? Almost all the stories we grew up with were about women being placed in situations where um, you know they're forced into it. It's not by choice. So so marriage becomes a really good metaphor for it. You're forced into a marriage with you know with a man of who's not a man of your choosing, mm -hmm. and um, and when you decide to make lemonade with that lemon, you know happiness will come to you. So this whole thing about how when you accept your lot in life, which is not a bad you know which is not a bad you know life lesson. Uh, but it's a really bad um, agency for women lesson because what you're telling women is that everybody else knows best what's for you. And also when you put your head down and you comply, you're going to find happiness. And then what goes with that is this whole concept of collateral damage, right? So when you as a woman, like Jamie said, uh, the, the responsibility of your family's happiness rests entirely on your shoulders. And so we are teaching women sacrifice, right? Because you're saying... If you choose your desire over, you know, over what you want, I mean, if you choose your family's happiness over your own desire, that's the only way everybody else gets to be healthy and whole. So the onus of that is on your shoulders. And I always thought that was a pretty crap thing, you know, <laughs> to teach women. And I wanted to, I wanted to write a woman who, who said no who said, you know, no, this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to go for what I desire. And, um, and I wanted her to have that collateral damage. And, and what happens in this book is that her daughter is almost the sum total of that collateral damage, because um, she has to, she ends up abandoning her daughter, who is the protagonist of the book. And so I wanted her to have that experience. I wanted that destruction to happen, but I wanted her to come out on the other side of it. Both these women, I wanted them to find their way out of it. And this book really, because it was about second chances, that was the journey, you know, that when you say no, sure, you know, all the, all the dark, doomy things they tell you that are gonna to happen to you if you choose desire. Yes, those happen, but there is light on the other side. And that's kind of where, what I was trying to explore. No, absolutely. And I think that's a very admirable thing to tackle and to really try and reinvent it from a classic tale of Austin's. I'm curious, Barbara, to, to continue the question for you. You deal with it in, in your book about on a multi-generational level and really, like you said, examining grandparent and grandchild which you know skips over a generation but as Sonali was saying this like collateral damage that comes with and I'm curious what drew you to that particular relationship in your book and, and how that came about in your process. Well one of the things that I would like to say about this first of all is that going to Sonali's point of mothers making choices that are not always uh, great for their children or for like what their families would want them to do. When I book, I was absolutely certain that Poppy, the 60 something mother of the, the, who is pretty much the main character, yes. I readers would absolutely hate her. Oh no! Completely on the side of Zoe who had been abandoned when she was seven years old. 
But no, that did not happen. I get so many letters about how terrible it is that Zoe just will not forgive her mother for this terrible thing. And what it tells me is that that is a pretty big fantasy for a lot of women. Like what if I had run away to India when I really wanted to? And then I met some, she falls in love with a married man and has an affair with him for like 12 years. They still didn't hate her. They still thought this was so romantic and interesting. So that must be a fantasy for a lot of people that what would my life have been like if I had take that, taken that other road? Um, and she does come back and she has to come to terms with everything that happened. But the grandmother granddaughter story came to me because I had a very seriously deep relationship with my grandmother. Like we were, we were tight, tight and much to uh, the, the despair of the other people in the family. It was just us two. Um, and now I have a granddaughter who is eight years old. And the minute she was born, I was thinking about, still, I was like, oh, there you are. I've been waiting for you all this time. And it is a completely different kind of relationship than happens with mothers and daughters. Mothers and daughters have a lot of things that they conflict about there. You know, they have, to, a mother has to try to help her daughter be okay in the world. Um, a grandmother just has to say, wow, you are so amazing and there has never been anyone like you in the world and let's go do some fun stuff. And that's a great relationship. It is so much fun. So that's kind of fun to play with the mother daughter dynamic and the grandmother granddaughter dynamic. Well, and we, I love that you, you said that and I'm thinking of literally images of, of time with my own grandmothers popped into my own head and it's very relatable. And I can't, I, it's hard for me to think of more books that ex have explored that, those relationships, but I'm curious to just in general about the three of you and your passion to write stories about women, that you have these wonderful flawed heroines in your books. And, you know, um, I, I have a tr pr trouble with people calling women's fiction, women's fiction. It should just be fiction, but but I just feel like your eye was so perfect and spot on there. Um, I, I'm curious though about what, what do you believe is important about women's fiction and why do you continue to write it um, with these wonderful heroines and again, flawed, you know, but relatable and wonderful. What, what is important about this genre to you and, and why do you continue to write it? Barbara, do you want to kick us off with that one? Sure, I can start that. Um, <laughs> I think that for, one, for one thing, uh, romance has been really, really undervalued for a long time because it's written by women for women about women's lives, you know, so that automatically kind of makes it lesser than. And the same thing is still like, they're trying to squeeze that onto women's fiction as well. But I think that we're pushing back pretty hard because yeah. there's such a wide readership. And we are so happy to see stories about ourselves, you know, like about the struggles that our mothers face, the struggles that we face, the things that our daughters are facing and struggling with. So it's like Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, you know, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? Well, when there's nine of them. When we have as many of as many books and they're taken as seriously as, as men's books and all the mainstream fiction, then we have enough and we've told a lot of our stories and we can like stand on equal ground. But until then, I think we're still kind of catching up and it's really important for all of us to tell all of the stories that we have to tell. So that's where I'm coming from on that. And that's where I've been since I was, the very first novels that I wrote when I was, you know, I was, had these little kids and I wanted to write domestic stories and, there just weren't any. There were no stories at all about the kind of life that I wanted to talk about. So yeah. I started writing them. In that's, that's awesome. I, I I love that. And it's something, you know, having been in different interviews with a variety of women authors who write in romance or women's fiction or both, I, I love asking this question because I, I do think it's so vital and so important. And Jamie, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too. And if you want to expand on what Barbara said or add something of your own go in a slightly different direction and, go for it. and because um for me it's a little bit more personal yeah I, I i don't tend to think maybe as globally as these two do um That's okay uh, and for me a lot of the a lot of it is about trying to figure out my own stuff or people close to me stuff i i do a lot of research um like about 
like in this book with um, the teenager that has anxiety and, you know, that's a crisis in our country or whatever with the rising levels of teen anxiety and stuff and things I see in my neighborhood with my friends struggling or myself struggling. And so for me, taking on a project and writing a story and doing the research to try to tell it correctly helps me figure out how I feel um, if I'm confronted with that, what I might do. So it, for me, like it is a little bit more personal. Um, I, and I just, I like those kinds of stories. I like to read those kinds of stories. Um, they give me hope. They, they make me feel like I'm not alone um, when I'm facing something new. So it, I don't, it's not, I don't have as much of a mission about it. It's, it's a more personal pursuit, I think. I think reading and writing is a very personal activity and that's where it starts, you know, and I think that that's very valid. So thank you for bringing that perspective to the table. Sonali, what else can you offer? Is it more universal, more personal for you? Mix of both? How would you, I, what would you say? Very much a mix of both because I mean, for one, um, my whole life growing up and reading uh, because there were so many more male writers available, I always felt like I was, um, you know, I was reading somebody's aspirational text, right? This is what you're supposed to be as a woman. You know, this is what makes you attractive. Uh, this particular kind of, you know, in inner dialogue makes you, you know, a, 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 the kind of woman that, that men want, you know? So I always felt like it was this blueprinting. And I feel like I'm a little bit guilty of doing that on the other side, because I definitely write aspiration <laughs> men, which is not to say that I don't have, and people say that to me, they're like, oh, you know, and especially I think if you write romance, people are like, that doesn't really happen. But, but for sure, I don't think that any of the men I write are unrealistic. You know, I mean, I, I, I was raised by a feminist father. I was raised, you know, I, I, my, my brother is, my, my husband is, but not overtly, not in the way, you know, that, that one would think. They struggle with their feminism. They struggle with this new world. Um, you know, I say there are three people in my marriage and it's uh, my husband, myself and the patriarchy. So, you know, it's, um, it, these are things that we're dealing with every day. So naturally those are the stories um, you know, that because a story, I think, for every writer is an exploration, right? There's something about the world that either bothers you or fascinates you. And that's kind of what you're trying to dismantle by writing these stories. And um, and, and so as as women, and so I absolutely loathe the label of women's fiction. Um, I always think of myself as writing fiction. You know, I'm telling stories. I'm a storyteller. I'm not even really a big fan. And this is, I mean, I, I love reading romance it is absolutely my choice uh you know my, my genre of choice even as a reader but that's basically because I love the emotional journey I I would much rather read about emotional connections than you know than about murder so it's <laughs> it's just my uh, I gravitate like even when I growing up um, reading the books that I read which were more you know general fiction and literary fi fiction I was always zeroing in on the on the romantic arc and you know that that should have told me something but but it is I think that we gravitate naturally towards stories that are relevant to us right yeah. I mean one of the reasons I get asked all the time why Austin right um it, it's such a cliche almost to write uh, you know to retell J Jane Austen today but but why her and for me specifically and since mine are not 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 scene by scene or even plot retellings uh, they are thematic retellings. They're, they're almost, I say, I like to say that they're homages to what I learned from her as a, as a young woman. And one of the things I learned from her as a young woman, which one of the things that made me want to be a writer, was the fact that I was not reading women um, who had agency or who wanted things and didn't die a horrible death for it or didn't you know or didn't go crazy uh you know for wanting things they could actually have stuff you know they dared to and her heroines i think at a time when society gave you no reason to believe you were worthy of anything she wrote heroines who were able to say you know when when their choice was between destitution and marriage and one of the richest men in england offered for them but, but when Lizzie Bennett thought that Darcy was a jerk, 
she chose destitution. She, she said, no, thank you. I'm worthy of more than, you, you know, of better than that. And so for no good reason, this woman was able to, to kind of slip into her stories, women who had self-worth, right? Yeah. And so, so it, it was so life altering for me that that these stories are just inside me and I had to I mean they, they came out in all my stories even the stories I've written before that and I think a lot of authors who work today you know your your, your material naturally tends toward the things that you know you've internalized uh, as you grew up uh, and 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 so it had to be Austin and had very much to do with that that experience of being a woman yeah I I love hearing that. One, just to talk about the cliche real quick. I'm an English major, a female English major who wrote her senior thesis in college on Northanger Abbey. So like, <laughs> you know, I'm cliches all over the place. But I, <laughs> I, um, I, I want something that you said struck me and I want to volley it back to you, but circle around to the other authors as well. You were talking about how an author spends time with the story and dismantling it and really trying to get at the heart of, of what you're writing. And I think that's something that many, many authors go through. So what did you learn either while you were writing this book, either about yourself or about the process? What's something that you, you learned? Like I said, I want to volley it back to Sonali, but I do want to ask this question of both Barbara and Jamie as well. Of, of What did you learn about this particular, while writing this particular book? Hmm. Um. For me, I was exploring, one of the things that started this for me is that I always think about the chances that my mother didn't get. You know, she was married at 17. She had four children by the time she was 22. And she is by far the smartest person I have ever known. She is hands down smarter than her brother who became a doctorate in psychology and wrote a million papers and you know, got all the support to go to college. She is a very talented artist who really never had the confidence to explore it. And it, it kills me. She's still here. She's still like, she works at a bookstore and she's 78. So that tells you where her priorities are. Um, but she breathed this into me, like do something, be something, you know, do all that. But when I was writing it, what I didn't realize was how much of the patriarchy I still carried with me you know, like how much I was still dragging along behind me, how many things that I still, I mean, I keep stumbling over these things. I'm, you know, I'm 60. So it's like, that was really a lot of my background and a lot of my history. But I thought I had broken free because I'm a woman, I have my own career, I've been divorced, and I'm fine. And boy, it's just not true. Some of the stuff writer, like, <laughs> let's not, let's not forget that. <laughs> some of the stuff that came up is just kind of surprising to me. So then to explore it from the youngest person's um, aspect, and she's still facing a lot of that pressure, but it's coming from girls who've still internalized the pressure to be a certain way for men. And that was sort of startling and interesting to me that it's like we are making strides, but we still have so much further to go. And I think young girls are really struggling with a lot of stuff right now. So that's where I learned on this book, so. Oh, that's so, thank you for your honesty and your vulnerability in that. I love, I love being able to hear that. And uh, Sonali, I'd love to know, what did you learn from Recipe from Persuasion other than maybe some really amazing food recipes? Like <laughs> let me talk about the amount of chips I ate while eating that book. <laughs> the cause of my COVID-15, but <laughs> what'd you learn? Uh, so first I do gain 10 pounds every time I write the book. <laughs> so I, you know, it's like, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> but I think um, even more than, and I'll talk about Recipe for Persuasion, but but I think more rel a more relevant book for what you're asking uh, was Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors, because I was, that's a gender flipped Pride and Prejudice. Yes. So I actually set out, and the way this, one of the ways that this whole series came about for me was that, you know, the, the, the way that we lap up a character like Darcy and I, absolutely love Mr. Darcy as do we all if we have a pulse but but I mean he's he's arrogant he completely owns his power and privilege um he feels only minimally guilty when he's wrong at least when he starts out no that's not true actually the reason he's such a great hero is because 
he's able to accept his mistakes so yeah. with so much grace but really we don't wait until he does that like we are you know panting all over him from page 1 when he's actually an arrogant jerk right and and i was always I, like I, and when we are writing and i and barbara and jamie and i have had this conversation about likability of uh, female characters right the the moment you one of the things that barbara said she started this conversation with how she expected people not to like poppy yeah. you know and and so likability is such a thing that we're automatically as storytellers trying to work into our stories at, you know at the very outset because there are such definitive rules about what readers and and so many of our readers are women so so even for them they like a certain kind of woman and certainly that you know and so so i was very curious to know if i could write a woman who was um who was arrogant who you know who completely owned her brilliance and her awesomeness and made no excuses for it um who was socially terribly uh, you know terribly awkward in terms of emotional maturity which is you know which is darcy and so i wanted her to have all of those things um and i wanted to see you know what i could do with that and it was completely life changing um the amount of um you know of, of turning of the mirror that happened for me because i started to question all the ways uh in which i behave that carries the patriarchy um as much as my husband does you know i mean how how uh, i a small thing like all the travel i did both of us travel for work uh of course i started to travel when when i started writing but our homecoming the act of coming home is completely different he's traveled for 24 24 years and he walks into the house with this whole i'm home now um take care of me <laughs> and i would walk into the home with this whole i'm so sorry i was gone what can i do to make this okay for everyone you know i mean not that overt but it was completely you know and so in small small things i started to realize how much of these roles um we we just have it's just in our dna and um and i think i started to question that and it it has changed the texture of my marriage it has changed how i approach the men in my life um it has um i was I, raising my daughter i was always kind of really really you know aware of it so 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 but but we've talked you know i mean we talk about it all the time it, you know that's the, that book and writing it and and that then led to show be an ashna and what happened so it's a progression from there because then i was able to write this this woman who fights that struggle that happened to me when i was writing pride prejudice and other flavors so that's so great um what i'm what i'm learning from that conversation was when i come back from a business trip i just need to sit on the couch and tell my boyfriend to take care of me that's <laughs> my new lesson for the day i'm i'm going to go out and tell my husband the same thing right <laughs> love, before we move on to audience questions i'd love for you to to tell us what you had also learned from your your latest book that everybody so and uh, mine's going to be a very different sort of discussion because a person so that makes sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For me, um, really, again, it was on a more micro level as I was digging into the relationship between Anne and her daughter Katie. Yeah, and thinking about like the way I was raised, like why today do we see so much more anxiety and depression in children? And of course, you can talk about things like social media and and the disconnectedness going on. But I also think that um, it the parenting styles are very different and. Um so when I was young at 5 years old my mom would open the door in the summer and say you know see you at dinner and I would go out and run around and be with my friends and she never once worried where I was there weren't cell phones or anything i mean i could have been bleeding anywhere uh she and my dad would leave us with relatives and take vacations without us they would you know they they had a life and i i don't say that she was a amazing mom i have I always had a very close relationship with my own mother and i did not go through the teen rebellion or anything i respected her a lot and um but but i think that um today when i look at my own parenting with my children and ann in the book her initial style was to maybe hover a little bit too much and to want to make things easier and better and to um 
basically by doing that, what I learned through the research that I did and thinking about my own family and writing this character and tr trying to map out an arc where what is she learning from all of this? It's really that, you know, all of the ways that maybe I robbed my children <laughs> of developing their own self-esteem through making mistakes and, and be learning resilience to come back and do things and maybe putting expectations on them for certain things that might not really be to their personality, you know, like imposing my own thoughts, not in a mean or malintentioned way, but just, it seemed natural to me because my parents were a certain way. And, um, and so I just kind of followed in that. And um, so I, I learned basically that sometimes, or maybe often it's better not to make your kids the center of everything. Cause that's so much pressure. That's so much pressure on them to be, to live up to your expectations, to not make mistakes and to not learn how to do even basic things. Cause you're doing everything, you know, to make life easy. Well, easy life as a child is not going to lead to an easy life as an adult because they're going to be ill-equipped and ill-prepared. And that that was sort of the, now the problem is I learned that as my kids are already teenagers and going into adulthood. So <laughs> too bad for them, I guess. <laughs> I mean, the grandbabies come and then you're like, yes. oh, then I can be like Barbara. I'll be like, right. oh, there you are. Looks at the same time. And there's a lot of similar themes. There's a teenager in trouble. There's a mother who's like trying to make that. Okay. There's a, uh, and there's a grandmother with dementia. Mine is in a different place in it, but it was really funny. We traded like a hundred pages and I was like, man, this mother seems like awfully interfering. And would she just keep doing all this? And Jamie read mine. She's like, man, this mom needs to take a little bit more like action with this. <laughs> because that was like, um, like our parenting styles. I was a pretty laissez-faire mother. Um, definitely. And I would do things differently now too myself. So anyway, I just thought that was funny that we both had these different. It is funny. It it's so, the mother characters in all of your books are fantastic. I, I just, I really truly enjoyed them all. And I, I think they're very relatable on multiple levels. And, and I, I want to say, I, we're going to open it up to audience questions um, now, which if, if you're interested in asking a question of one, two, or all three of these authors, there's a, a chat box that you just have to type in your question um, next to the viewing screen that you're on. But I want to also, while people are thinking of their questions, just say thank you, um, because each of you brought in a level of personability and vulnerability and honesty to your questions. You don't have to reveal that much about your life in, in these author interviews, but I, one, for me, I really appreciate it, and I know that our viewers do as well, because um, writing is a very solitary and intimate process, so thank you for your willingness to to share that with us about various levels of your personal life. So I know that I appreciate it. It makes authors seem much more human than, you know, <laughs> like, oh my God, they wrote a book. But uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, we do have one question to start us off. Um, people would like to know, what are you reading right now? Which another way I like to phrase this is what media are, is getting you through the pandemic right now? Like, what are you, what are you watching? What are you reading? What are you, what are you listening to? Uh, well, Jamie, I, you know, I, right I, we're nodding. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just finished reading um, The Vanishing Half, which oh, was yeah. a heavy read, and then I followed it up with Beach Read, which was super cute and <sighs> very humorous. And right now I am reading, um, I think it's called All Adults Here. Uh, oh, yes, by Emma Straub. Yes. So I'm, I'm maybe 20% into that. And it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure where it's going to all go, but it's, it, you won't. <laughs> I, 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 I can tell already that I know I'm going to be surprised. I'm trying to guess what, you know, where things are going to go, but it's, um, but I'm enjoying it. It's different. I've never read any of her books before. So this is my introduction to her. So that's what I'm reading right now. So Nolly, what, what do you, what media are you consuming right now? Oh, uh, I have, I just wrote, um, you know, the end. I'm actively working to get um, my book out to my editor. So I have been, um, so I've been a little, little behind uh, on reading. And um, so, so the first thing I'm going to read is Truth of the Matter. <laughs> so that's been on my, I have read pieces of it because, you know, we um, yeah. were friends and we kind of um, do that. And so, 
Um, I think there was there was one <laughs> there, there was one scene in there especially that was so perfect. Uh, you know, emo- emotional. The the pitch of it was so perfect, and I remember Jamie was. Um, was you know was wondering about it and when she sent it to me I'm like I'm going to be no help this is just such a perfect scene in terms of you know um the emotion just like floating up uh in in this amazingly understated way and um and so I've been dying to kind of figure out what happens you know after that so that's going to be my first thing I'm also I also have um beach read on my um um, on my nightstand, on my virtual nightstand. It's Actually, fun. it's not virtual. It's a real, I have the real book. Um, so, so uh, you know, I've heard such lovely things about that. But um, oh, I, I, I did read, Jamie, which was the book that you uh, recommended that I read? That was one of my, oh, um, in, five oh, in five years. years, in five years. And, um, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so it was, uh, it, it was, it was really interesting because it had this amazing like forward pull to it that um, you know that I just think in terms of craft was very cleverly done and and I really enjoyed that. Um, I in in romance I read Priscilla Oliveras's upcoming book, so it actually comes out next year. It's called Anchored Hearts, and um, and Pris has this way. It's set on um, on. Um, Key West. So yes. she has this, and it's 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 a Cuban American family, and she just has this way of creating this familia that she does, and and community, and it's just it's a second chance um, at first love, and they're just the most endearing and adorable characters, and I really enjoyed it. I can't wait for it to come out. I'm so glad this is being recorded, so I can go back and watch it later and add to my own PBR. <laughs> Barbara, what are you reading, watching, listening to right now? I have been really tired the last few weeks, so I've been doing a lot of binge watching of Netflix and, um, you know, Hulu has been my, the thing is, is that a lot of those shows are really, really, really dark. And I think there's something that's sort of a relief about all that darkness, because no matter what's going on, it's not that, you know what I mean? (laughs) that horrible. But on the flip side, I usually am a pretty big women's fiction reader and I've been almost reading entirely nothing but romance right now, which I always read some romance, but I have been like, just, I like, can't find anything to read, can't find anything to read. I'm like, I found romance and now I can read it. So I'm right now I'm reading One to Watch, which is a really, really funny story. And it's really poignant about a, um, a large woman who goes onto a dating show and she's like the bachelorette or whatever wow, it's really good and it's very sensitive and it's really intense, but very sweet. And I read Ghosting, a love story, which is, um, I can't remember the author's name, but I just peeled through that one too. It was set in New York City. It was like um, the Cyrano story, um, two people writing letters, you know, like that. It was really good. So those are the things I've been doing lately. That's awesome. I feel that romance feel very hard. I, I finished Beverly Jenkins' new one in The Women Who Dare trilogy the wild rain one i got an edelweiss copy of that so um this i i feel that very much so um i i love i love also hearing what authors are recommending you know what i mean it's always a really nice little extra uh recommendation we have here what advice do you have to um a a writer yeah what what advice do you have to writers um you know me either wanting to get published or how to stay inspired, however you want to interpret that question. But what what advice do you have for any writers? Can I steal Barbara's advice? Run, too? run. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Turn around and run. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I'm going to steal something that I, I'm going to credit Barbara with helping me with something that took me too long to learn. And what it is, is that I always really admired Um, certain other authors' voices, like Barbara and Sonali, who both have these very poetic um, and melodic voices in their stories. And I love when I read that. I mean, it just, I love it. So I wanted to be able to do that, but that is not my voice at all. I'm a very, you know, I was a lawyer before and I'm very frank and direct and almost to the point maybe sometimes of being abrupt. And so I always struggled with, um, you know, that I couldn't 
be what I wanted. And Barbara finally was like, stop it, you know, <laughs> lean into your own voice and you'll find readers who like your voice, just like I have readers who like my voice and just be you, be authentically you. And it was very freeing when I finally, um, she, I, I don't know if you remember telling me that we were in Denver, yeah. remember we were sitting there having drinks in Denver um, at the conference at that place wherever we went at night and we're eating like wings and stuff late at night. It was all, all bad stuff, but that was my big good takeaway. And it, ever since then, I've, I've felt a lot lighter uh, when I'm sitting there struggling. I still struggle a lot with writing the drafts, but it's, I would say from the beginning, I wish I had had that in my head. Barbara, do you have another piece that you want to add or do you just want to be like that one? Very wise, listen to whatever she says. <laughs> Exactly. She's very, very wise. Like she's our that come that I always go back to is Madeline Engel, who wrote this really inspirational book about writing, Walking on Water. And she what? just says, you know, what if the book is coming to you? The book is coming to you to be enfleshed, and you say no. And then that book never gets written, and all of the people who might have taken relief or pleasure or peace or whatever it is that you might have given to those people just disappears. It's not there anymore. So it's kind of your obligation. It's a holy obligation to write whatever books come to you. And I would also say that you have to finish what you start because that's the only way they ever actually get finished Yes, is finishing them. Sonali, what can you add? I think that, um, you know, I mean, what these two said, um, but, but I think that we live in a world when it is so easy to believe that all of the noise, all of the author stuff is, um, you know, is really what, what writing is about, you know, doing events like this, book signings, social media, uh, uh, you know, branding, all of these, you need to do that. That's the world we live in. Um, but that's a distraction. I, the, the thing to focus on, especially if you're a new writer, the, the single thing that will, uh, you know, that this is about is the story itself, the writing itself, the craft. Um, and, and I think that, um, that all the other magic can come together. Um, if you have written the best book, you can, right? And, and it, this is about leaving everything on the page. Like, as I'm writing, that is the only thing that goes through my mind as I'm writing this scene and as I refine this scene, this chapter, this line is everything that I have inside me in here and on here at this moment. And that's really, and I think when you read books, when I read books, it, it is absolutely obvious to me which author has done that. And those are the stories that I will take with me to my grave, you know, that, that become a part of who you are. And, 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 the distractions and all the other stuff is is just distractions. I, man, I feel like I just need like a notebook of just like inspirational, <laughs> wonderful quotes because I feel like this whole time there's been advice and life advice and writing advice. And, and I really, I know that our viewers feel it too. Just thank you so much for this. I, I hate the fact that we're at our time. I feel like I could just keep talking to the three of you for, the next two hours, but or more. But I, I want to, I want to give you all a chance to remind people about your books, um, and remind them where they can find you online and, and follow your previous work. You know, uh, maybe because a lot of times on panels like this, someone may have heard of Barbara's work, but may may have never heard of Jamie's, and so now they've been introduced to all three of you wonderful authors. So why don't we go backwards in the way that we introduce ourselves? So that would be Sonali first. Why don't you just tell people who you are about your book and where they can find you? So I'm Sonali Dev again, and you can find me at sonalidev.com. And, um, and basically I write women's stories, women, um, you know, that are specifically set in the Indian culture in some way, for sure. Um, I, I like to call them stories with a Bollywood beat, but, but that are entirely, yeah, that, that are universal. And basically that are this tightrope walk that women do between personal freedom and community and family and, uh, and expectation. And basically that's what I'm exploring in my stories. And um, they're a little funny, they're, you know, a little quirky and, um, and, and um, 
always trying to explore something is what I think that they are. So uh, Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors, uh, Recipe for Persuasion, and I have Incense and Sensibility coming up. <laughs> I love, year. I've gotten to read the drafts of that. Oh, oh I'm so it. good. <laughs> and, and I love these women. So uh, absolutely, um, you know, truth of the matter first, like right now, buy that. <laughs> and um, and yeah, read on and support Tattered Cover. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Jamie, you're in the middle again. <laughs> again, Jamie Beck. And um, my website is jamiebeck.com. And all of my social media is there. So you can find my Facebook, my Instagram, my newsletter, any, any place where I am. Um, and again, I write, I've written romance. I've written blended romance and women's fiction. And now I'm leaning more heavily into women's fiction. And I would say a common thread in most of my books has to do with like redemption. Um, people who've made big mistakes and need to figure out how to come back from that. So that's something I find interesting. Show us your pretty new book again oh. that just came out today. Isn't it? <laughs> I have to say, this is by far, I've had, I think this is my 16th book. Wow. I think this might be my favorite cover. I thought they just knocked this out of the park. You, it's so pretty. Can I just say, you all three got really lucky on your covers because oh, Barbara has this right. lovely sense of mystery and the coast, oh, and then Sonali's is so like, oh my gosh, you all got very lucky with your covers. Um, and then Barbara, if you could close this out, let us know about your book and where, where they can find you. First of all, I'm going to say that Tattered Cover has been my favorite bookstore since I was a very young teenager. So it's really always such an honor to be here and like supporting this fabulous bookstore. And I really can't wait to get up to the and go up there and wander the aisles. Um, so I I'm to say hi to me <laughs> so we can meet in person. <laughs> Good. Um, my, I'm Barbara O'Neill. Uh, my website is barbaraoneill.com. Um, my book, my latest book is The Lost Girls of Devon, which you can find in bookstores everywhere. And you, my, I, a reviewer wrote something about this book that I thought really summed up my work in a beautiful way. She said, Barbara O'Neill writes about wounded women who need other women to heal. And I think that sums it up so beautifully. That's nice. Wow. Hire her to do your marketing. That's amazing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Well, and, and I, I'm McKaylee, I'm with Tattered Cover Bookstore. And once again, I just want to remind you all that our stores are open. You can come in and purchase copies or purchase copies of Recipe for Persuasion, Truth of the Matter, and The Lost Girls of Devon online on our website at tatteredcover.com. If you three ladies will stay on for just a moment, but we'll cut out the live stream. Again, I just want to thank you guys for spending your, your Tuesday evening with us. And we hope you stay safe. Happy reading. <laughs> Bye, everyone. And 